thank you for coming and for those of you that are on the webcast, good afternoon to you also. Uh, today we'll be um, hearing from Dr. Bart Ostro, who is the uh, Chief of Air Pollution Epidemiology in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, our sister agency. And he'll be speaking on the effects of fine particle species on daily mortality and morbidity in six California counties, the results from his CalFine study. Um, Bart's um, primary responsibilities are to develop OEHA's recommendations for state ambient air quality standards and to investigate the potential health effects of criteria air pollutants. He's published over 75 scientific papers and his research has contributed to the development of both federal and state air pollution standards for ozone, particulate matter, and lead. His accomplishments are legion, so I'll have to go through them very quickly. He was co-author of US EPA's cost-benefit analysis that resulted in the federal ban of lead and gasoline, recently served on a National Academy of Sciences uh, committee addressing the quantification of health benefits of reducing ambient air pollution, and currently a member of US EPA's scientific advisory board committee responsible for reviewing US EPA's quantification of health benefits. Dr. Ostro also has worked on establishing international air quality standards for the World Health Organization and estimating the global burden of disease related to air pollution and been involved in air pollution policy and epidemiologic training in various parts of the world. His model for estimating the health and economic benefits of air pollution control developed for the World Bank and WHO has been used extensively throughout the developing world. And in, 19, and sorry, in 2005, he was the recipient of the Clean Air Award by the California branch of the American Lung Association. Wow, that's a lot. So with that, uh, let's uh, welcome Dr. Ostro. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. So yes, uh, today I'm going to be reviewing the OEHA or the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment efforts to estimate the health effects relating to species of uh, fine particles, looking at both mortality and morbidity. So the first thing I want to say for those of you who are the millions of you around the world who are watching this webcast, or maybe the four people in Vallejo who are watching this webcast, uh, take seriously the, the, uh, on the website where it says, to download the slides, I've put the, uh, the uh, website here, and I'll read it because you might not even be able to see this. I've watched some of these webcasts myself, and often you can't see the slides, and I'm going to be presenting a lot of uh, figures and a lot of graphs. So it's um, arb.ca.gov backslash research backslash seminars backslash seminars dot htm. And uh, you can download all the slides there so that you can actually see them. Uh, you'll have some trouble seeing them on the webcast itself. Um, first, I want to acknowledge uh, the many people who have played a role in this work. There's a lot of data and a lot of analysis going on. And uh, I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Rachel Broadwin, uh, Brian Malig, and Lindsay Roth for organizing the data, making sure it's of uh, the highest possible quality and keeping track of all the work as well as car 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 carrying out a lot of the analysis itself. So, and there's on the list here, you see many others who have contributed to the efforts. So I'm going to talk about the following things. First, I'll provide a brief introduction on fine particles on PM2.5 for those of you who uh, are not so up on that. Then also talk about some epidemiologic results of fine particles and its components. Um, talk a little bit about what time series analysis does and doesn't do. Uh, we'll be presenting some mortality study results that have been published recently. Uh, then I'll talk about some preliminary findings on susceptible subgroups. That is the issue of are there uh, certain groups uh, in California that might be more sensitive to some of the components of fine particles. Um, I'll also be presenting some preliminary findings on morbidity, specifically on hospital admissions, uh, discuss the biological plausibility of some of the results that we have to date, and then give a summary. And I think we'll have time, hopefully, for questions at the end. And I'd also encourage uh, 
people here. If there's something that's not clear to uh, let me know, you can interrupt while we're going on and um, I'll try to clarify any issues. So um, PM2.5 or fine particles is a heterogeneous mixture of solids and liquids. Um, some particles are emitted directly into the air, uh, sources such as uh, diesel from trucks and buses, uh, wood smoke and biomass from fire stove, from wood stoves and uh, forest fires all will directly emit particles into the air. And also uh, we have things like sulfates and nitrates which start out as gases, as, as nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide uh, which get converted um, through chemistry to particles and end up uh, uh, being exposed, uh, people being exposed to these. And a lot of these sources are from combustion. How small are these fine particles? There's an ARB slide that we've used over and over. Uh, relative to a human hair, which is 60 microns in diameter. Then we look on the right-hand side and we see cross-sectionally uh, how that human hair looks. And then relative to that, a fine particle of two and a half microns and below. And also another cut size that we use when we talk about particles is PM10, particles below 10 microns. And you can see these PM2.5 are very, very small microscopic particles um, that uh, penetrate into the deep lung and are responsible for some significant health effects. Also, the size of the particles is related to the composition. Uh, in the fine mode, we see things like sulfates, nitrates, ammonia, carbon, metals, and organics. Uh, the coarse mode tends to have different sources and include things like blowing dust, uh, soil, silica, salts, pollen, endotoxins, and tire rubbers and, and other things as well. But those are the dominant uh, constituents in each of those groups. You've also probably heard about ultrafines, which are the particles below 0.1 uh, micron in diameter. So, uh, Regarding the existing epidemiologic studies to date relating fine particles to mortality, there's been now uh, three multi-city studies relating short-term, that is daily exposure, to daily mortality. Uh, there was a six-city study conducted um, using the, the now famous Harvard six-city data uh, that showed associations between fine particles and daily mortality in, in those six cities. Also, uh, Burnett et al. conducted studies in the eight largest cities in Canada and also found associations between daily exposures to fine particles and daily mortality. And we published a study last year uh, using nine counties in California where we also found associations between um, fine particles and mortality. And there's a, several other single city studies that have been conducted recently. Uh, there's a lot more studies, of course, on PM10 because there's about a 15-year history of collecting PM10 data, and PM2.5 has only recently been collected on a more regular basis. Now, besides these short-term types of studies, there's also some very important studies that have looked at long-term exposure to fine particles. And um, these include the studies by Dockery and Layden uh, using the Harvard Six City study and looking at exposures over many years. There's also studies using the American Cancer Society cohort, uh, the Pope et al. studies, again, looking at uh, concentrations of particles over several years. And a reanalysis of these data sets uh, in an independent set of studies funded by the Health Effects Institute by Krusky et al., um, which uh, basically replicated the initial findings of the Dockery and the Pope studies, showing uh, associations between long-term exposure to fine particles and mortality. Now, one of the crucial questions that has come up um, is what about the relative toxicity of all these different components of PM2.5? Um, for example, several years ago, the National Academy of Science determined, uh, suggested that determining the toxicity of the different particle characteristics um, and of the different sources is a major research question. And the World Health Organization has also asked a similar question. Um, what, what can we say about the different components of 
of PM2.5 in terms of its relative importance. So there have been very few epidemiologic studies examining either the specific components or the sources themselves of fine particles. And such information could help us target pollution control, could help us prioritize our efforts if we find certain agents, certain components that are particularly toxic relative to the whole mix of constituents. That could be a, a priority in terms of our pollution control. And likewise, if we find some, some constituents that are relatively benign, that might also affect our prioritization. But ultimately, identifying the relative toxicity can reduce the overall abatement cost to society. Also, it can improve our estimates of health impact assessment. That is, when we go out and try to actually determine what is the current health and economic cost of exposure to fine particles. Or another way of saying it is, what are the potential benefits of reducing fine particles? If we're controlling certain particles, like elemental carbon or nitrates or whatever, uh, those can have very different benefits than controlling uh, other particles or, or controlling PM2.5 mass as a whole. So this, would, this information would help uh, identify the um, economic benefits of specific components. And finally, uh, there's been several very large multi-city studies. For example, the NMAPS studies uh, sponsored by the Health Effects Institute, a study of the 90 largest cities in the US. And they typically show uh, a very uh, heterogeneous response in terms of the associations between uh, PM2.5 and mortality, as well as PM2.5 and morbidity. And uh, some people have suggested that the variation in responses might be due to different chemical composition as you move around the country. So identification, again, of the relative toxicity, the relative importance of the different components might help address this issue of heterogeneity. Now, as I mentioned, there are a few studies to date that have looked at um, either sources or components of fine particles. The, there was a study conducted in 2000 by Mardal in uh, Phoenix, which showed that elemental carbon and organic carbon, uh, as well as motor vehicle exhaust, were related to mortality. The study by Leiden et al., again using the Harvard Six Cities study data, showed that markers for mobile sources and markers for coal combustion, i.e. sulfates, uh, were related to mortality in those cities. And finally, again, in the Canadian studies, Burnett et al. showed that uh, sulfate, zinc, nickel, and iron, uh, many other components were not measured, but these components were also associated with um, daily mortality. But as you can see, there's very few studies looking specifically at the sources and at the components. Now, another thing to realize is that the composition of fine particles in California is very different from most other regions. So even as we see studies coming online in the East Coast or maybe in Europe, um, they may or may not have full implications for um, California. First of all, the source mix and the chemistry is different here. We, we don't have uh, coal burning and uh, oil burning for um, power. Um, we have a very different climate, of course, than, than the rest of the US. Um, and the atmospheric chemistry is different. So the mix of the PM2.5 components is going to be different. Specifically, we see a lot more of nitrates in our PM2.5 mix here. Uh, most of the East Coast and um, other parts of the world show more sulfates. Uh, we have lower sulfate levels and more nitrate levels than many other areas. Also, when we looked at the PM2.5 mix as well as the components, we see that the winter concentrations tend to be higher for most of these particles than the summer concentrations, which is, again, different than many other areas in the world. Um, and my last two points here are conjecture at, my, at this point, since there's not a lot of data on this, but um, I believe that there's greater indoor penetration of, of particles from the outside to the indoors in California because we don't have the winterization efforts. Our homes are, are built with less of that. Um, people tend to have uh, windows open more often, so there's probably greater exposures from some of these sources. And also, again, having spent uh, many years on the East Coast and now 20 years or so in California, I believe, although it's not supported by the data yet, 
that uh, people do spend more time outdoors in, in California than uh, in the East Coast where a lot of these other studies have been undertaken. <clears throat> so what were the research questions that we wanted to look at? Uh, basically two. First, are components of fine particles associated with adverse health, including both death and disease, that is mortality and morbidity? And second, if so, are risk estimates associated with those components greater than those associated with PM 2.5 mass? In other words, how, how good are, is PM 2.5 as proxying the risks of specific components? So we wanted to look at both of those issues relating to mortality and morbidity. So what data did we have? We had, we collected uh, data that ARB and the uh, US EPA have uh, uh, been sponsoring now for several years. We had 24-hour um, averages of PM 2.5 mass as well as species um, from six different counties. There's certainly an effort going on in many, many more counties, but we found six counties where there was a lot of population and enough of the fine particle and species data. You can see the counties listed here, Fresno, Kern, Riverside, Sacramento, San Diego, and Santa Clara. Um, four years of data, 2000 to 2003, and the total population in those counties is about nine million, about one-fourth of the state population. 13 different components, uh, we looked at basically 13 different components. Again, about 60 or 70 components were collected, but we wanted to focus on those that were related to combustion and for which there was some belief that there might be associations with some health uh, outcomes and specifically things like elemental carbon and organic carbon, nitrate, sulfates, calcium, so on. Uh, a lot of the metals, copper, iron, um, zinc, and as well as potassium, which um, is a reasonable marker for um, wood smoke. Um, we had two monitors in each county with collection on an every third or every six day basis. And also uh, we added PM 2.5, but not species data from three other counties um, just to see if power was going to play a role, statistical power was going to play a role. So we wanted to add some PM 2.5 data and see what was happening there. So besides the pollution data, we had weather data because we always need to control for the effects of weather in our analysis. Uh, mortality data from the Department of Health Services vital statistics data. Um, we aggregated the daily counts of mortality into several categories, including all-cause mortality, taking out accidents and uh, homicides. We also looked at some disease-specific categories like cardiovascular and respiratory disease, and also looked at mortality for those above age 65. And in a later analysis, we stratified um, the mortality and looked at mortality by gender, by race, ethnicity, and by educational attainment, since that data are available on the um, death certificates. So for example, we could look at um, mortality among high school graduates and mortality among non-high school graduates to see if these different um, categories would modify or change the risks um, from the different components. So our analysis ultimately was restricted to counties with more than 180 observations over the period. And the total observations roughly for each species that we looked at was, was about 1870. Um, so it's basically four counties, uh, sorry, six counties times four years, roughly 60 observations per year. Uh, and um, believe it or not, this is a relatively small data set um, as these time series analysis goes. So we always have to keep in mind that, that uh, the power to detect these effects might be limited by the size of the data set. Now besides the mortality data, we also collected um, daily hospital admissions again from the Department of Health Services from their OSHPED data set. Um, for the six counties, we had about nine and a half million admits for the same four year period. We looked at things that others have commonly looked at when they've been looking at PM10, um, looking at all respiratory disease and some subclassifications such as asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia, and uh, COPD, chronic respiratory disease. Um, we also stratified by age in certain cases. 
and then looked at cardiovascular disease and also looked at some subcategories including heart attacks, heart failure, and stroke, and again did some stratification um, of this by race and gender. The methods that we used in our analysis are um, by now well developed. Um, we used time series regression um, using um, uh, Poisson models that link air pollution to mortality and morbidity. These methods were reviewed pretty thoroughly in a Health Effects Institute um, workshop several years ago where uh, we showed that although there's lots of different ways to look at these, uh, to conduct the analysis and to develop models, that the results uh, tended to be relatively insensitive to the specific models that we were using. Um, in this case, we model daily counts of mortality or hospitaliza hospitalizations using Poisson regression, since it's a relatively rare event, and we control for the time varying covariates, things like time, weather, and day of week, as well as air pollution. Now, one of the interesting things that's come up over the last five or eight years is the use of smoothing splines to model the effects of time, temperature, and humidity, and you could also use them for other things, but these are how they're primarily used. And um, smooths are flexible, data-driven functions that approximate the relationship of mortality to whatever factor you're looking at, let's say time. And the degrees of freedom of the smooth actually determine the bumpiness of, of the fit. And um, why is it important to use these smooths? Well, let's take the example of um, season. We know that there's patterns in mortality data um, in just about every city in the world that mortality is higher in the winter months, probably because of respiratory infections, pneumonia, and so on. And um, so there's a natural cycle. Mortality peaks in the winter and uh, lower in the summer. So you can imagine that any pollutant that also peaks in the winter uh, might by accident show associations with <coughs> mortality. And likewise, any pollution like ozone, any pollutant like ozone um, that peaks in the summer might show an inverse relationship with mortality unless you take into account the seasonal aspects of mortality directly in your model. So for example, um, here's a plot of mortality in Sacramento, and I think you can see the beginning of an outline of a um, seasonal pattern here. And when we put a smooth in here with about four degrees of freedom per year, we get a uh, curve that looks like this that takes in the underlying cycles. So then the analysis says, okay, let's, uh, we're taking into account first the underlying cyclical patterns of mortality. Now we want to explain those points uh, that deviate from that known cycle. So this, this smooth is included directly into the regression and controls for the time and seasonal effects of mortality. Um, likewise, you can have non-linear and even non-monotonic functions that relate temperature um, or humidity to mortality as well. So these are very powerful ways of controlling for potential factors that will, uh, factors that could, could potentially confound the association with mortality. So ultimately, uh, the Poisson model looks something like this. It's uh, the log of mortality at time t as a function of some constant some function beta, which is our important estimate, a beta coefficient times PM two and a half for T, or we can look at lags, T minus one, T minus three, whatever. We control for day of the week, time uh, with four degrees of freedom, um, temperature and humidity as well. In this case, we a priori specified models uh, with one day lags in temperature and humidity, and we conducted additional sensitivity analysis to see whether uh, differences in the functions for temperature and, and humidity, different lags, had any kind of effect. So it's important to control for any other thing that might vary on a daily basis and affect mortality, like time, temperature, and uh, humidity, as well as the day of the week. Um, and I want to note, for those of you who aren't um, aware of or know that much about time series analysis, questions we always get about 
what about smoking? How do you control for that or occupational uh, exposure? And it's important to note that in, in these time series analyses that look at daily associations between mortality and air pollution, uh, things that don't change on a daily basis with air pollution and aren't associated with mortality will not be confounders. So for example, you don't expect people to be smoking more on high air pollution days necessarily. You don't expect occupational exposure and so on and indoor generated pollution to be uh, changing on a daily basis with outdoor levels of air pollution. Therefore, these things are really not confounders in these time series studies. And it makes these time series studies a very efficient way statistically of, of determining the effects independently of uh, air pollution on our health outcome. So one other thing here is that um, we're look, we looked at single day pollutant lags of zero to four days. We didn't have daily data, so we couldn't look at cumulative averages like three or four day averages, um, which tend to show greater effects than the single day lags. Not surprisingly, you would expect um, pollution over several days, not just one day to have an effect but we could only focus on single day lags and we really focused on lags of zero and of three. So we estimated relationships for every county, each of our counties, and then we combined our individual county results using random effects meta-analysis. Ultimately, we'll be presenting our results in terms of excess risk, which is the relative risk minus one times 100. It gives you a percent change in mortality per microgram or per 10 micrograms. And we'll be presenting that also for interquartile range, um, the IQR, which is the 75th minus the 25th um, percentile of the distribution of the pollutant. Okay, so that's a fairly common thing to look at the excess risk for the IQR. And as I indicated, we conducted lots of different sensitivity analysis. We examined other types of smoothing functions we um, looked at ways of dealing with missing data. And we also wanted to look at season specific effects, specifically defining a cool season as the Ar October to March period. So first the uh, general mortality results and um, these results now have been published in environmental health perspectives and the citation is there on the slide. You can uh, get all the full results if you wish. Um, here's our counties. The counties that have the black uh, borders around them are the six counties with the pollution average. And you can see we went from around 12.6 um, in Sacramento down to 27.1 in Riverside. So there's a, a nice range of pollution exposure. Uh, California proudly ranks among the number one uh, areas in the, in the country in terms of uh, pollution concentrations. Um, and then the um, three other counties that we collected PM two and a half, but not species data are also shown. That includes um, LA and Orange counties, as well as Contra Costa County was included. And to put these numbers in perspective, the federal PM two and a half standard is 15 micrograms for an annual average. Whereas in California, we have a 12 microgram per cubic meter annual average standard. So you can see that most or all the counties uh, um, do not meet the California standard and there's a mix in terms of meeting the federal standard. Now in terms of the distribution of components, um, we do find that, <coughs> that organic carbon make up uh, a large amount of the fine particles, um, about seven microns relative to the mean of, in our study of around 19 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. So roughly 35, 40% of the total mix is organic carbon. Nitrates also play a big role. And then other significant players are elemental carbon, which is a pretty good marker for diesel in California. Uh, sulfites put out about two micrograms. Uh, we have some traces of some of the metals, copper, iron, and zinc, potassium. And then there's a big curve on the other, which is probably um, some other or inorganic compounds. Now here's the actual quantitative results and let me walk you through this um, particular table. One of the bad things about having so much data is it's hard to figure out how to present it in a way that, under, that others can understand what's going on here. So let me 
walk you through this and through the next slide. Uh, so this is showing three different outcomes. Um, we actually didn't find a lot with respiratory mortality, so I'm um, not presenting the results right here. But looking at all-cause cardiovascular and mortality for, for those above 65, and we have some of our highlighted uh, elements on the left-hand side. And the numbers in there indicate the day of the lag. We went from zero to three single-day lags. It indicates the lags that were statistically related to the mortality outcome. So just as an example for um, cardiovascular disease, we saw that for PM2.5 as a whole, uh, lags of one and three were significant. And the colors also mean something here for those of you who are looking at this in color. Um, the red means we found associations with uh, the element at 0.05, and the green was significant at 0.10. So, um, for example, EC, OC, and nitrates were all associated with cardiovascular. Um, EC at a 0.05 level, and OC and nitrates at a 0.10 level. So hopefully that's clear to people. I see some, some nods, so I'm assuming that people on the webcast um, viewing will also see what's going on. Now to see if we can confuse you further, um, some people like... Uh, graphs rather than numbers and tables. So this is presenting roughly the same information. Um, but let me again walk you through it. This is on one axis the percent excess risk per IQR, per interquartile range. On the x-axis is, is several of their species with, uh, three dif uh, with two different lags, a zero lag and a three-day lag for each of the species. And um, <coughs> a Star, one star over the lag. I should also say that the, the line there indicates the central estimate for the risk as well as a 95% confidence interval. One star indicates significant at an, a 0.10 level, two stars a 0.05 level. And a general way to look at this is if the confidence interval does not include zero, that means it's significant at a, at least a 0.05 level or better. If it just touches zero and goes a little bit beyond, it usually means significant at a, at a slightly higher level. Um, if there's a large overlap, it usually means that there's little association. So again, um, looking at this briefly, and I'm going to be presenting a lot of tables, so I don't expect people to memorize uh, what, uh, that which element is associated with each outcome and so on, but just to get a general picture of what's coming out here. And uh, the general picture we see here is that things like PM2.5, EC, OC, uh, nitrates, and in this case, zinc, um, are all associated with our cardiovascular mortality um, using a full year, using all of the data that were available. And you can see also that the lag three tends to show greater risks than the lag zero as we have a delay in our uh, dose response, delay in time, we see stronger effects. And that held up for a lot of the species. Now, a lot of the species that we didn't present here are ones that don't show much association um, with mortality. Now, here's a repeat of the previous slide, but now focusing on the cool season, where I indicated the concentrations are a lot higher, usually two or three times higher. And we see lots more associations with a particular species. And uh, again, for all cause in cardiovascular, as, as well as age greater than 65, almost all the listed, well, in fact, all the listed components have some association. Um, we p see particularly consistent associations with OC and sulfates, nitrates play a role, uh, iron, zinc, and um, EC, as well as what we call PM2.5 extended, which is the larger the nine county data set of PM2.5 in which all the lags were significant. So this is a data set that's larger. It also includes LA County. Um, so we have a lot, lot more data and um, therefore a greater ability to determine, to find an association given one really exists. So we see a lot more associations during those winter months. And again, during this uh, cool season, Looking at it graphically, um, same conclusion, PM2.5, ECOC, nitrates, sulfates, zinc, all showing associations 
with um, cardiovascular mortality. Now, one of the issues um, that I indicated was important is what about the relative risks of all these different um, elements? So if you look at the far right-hand column, that's what the graphs were just showing, the percent change per IQR. And you can see the range is pretty close um, from about 0.5 for potassium K up to uh, 2%. We do see that elemental carbon shows a greater risk for the, given the distribution of these elements uh, in the environment, which is the IQR. That's how do we really observe these things. But another issue is what about per microgram? That's really telling us what the relative um, effects are of each of these particular elements. And when you look at that, you see a different picture. You see, for example, that EC and potassium uh, using the, the column that's marked beta times 100, that's the beta, the uh, random effects, meta-analysis, beta coefficient times 100, which basically gives you the effects per microgram in terms of the percent change in mortality. You can see that for PM2.5, it's roughly 0.1% um, uh, change per microgram, or 1.1% per 10 microgram. And you can compare that to much larger effects for some of the elements, such as EC, um, OC, nitrates, even sulfates, and um, some of the other metals, which are not listed here. So I have a caveat to, to um, indicate about that, which I'll be discussing at the end, but a little preview is when you do this analysis, of course, a lot of these elements will be correlated over time. So one of the difficulties here is separating out the true independent effects of, let's say, EC versus nitrate and so on. So that's an ongoing problem. So you have to look at these numbers with a little bit of caution in terms of indicating one single element is of concern. But um, there's certainly some suggestion that some of the elements, such as EC and, and nitrates and so on, um, do provide or generate much greater effects per microgram than the PM2.5 mass as a whole. So uh, the next question we wanted to look at was effect modification. That is, are there subgroups that are particularly susceptible to the components of PM2.5? There's been a little work relating susceptibility to PM10. Um, I haven't seen very much on PM2.5, and I haven't seen any, of course, on species and susceptibility. So we looked at three different groups. We looked at um, um, breakdowns by gender, by race, ethnicity, and by education attainment. We didn't find much differences by gender. Um, males and females seem to have the same mortality associations, um, which is fairly consistent with the previous literature on PM10. But we did find very big differences by race, ethnicity. The uh, white triangles here are cardiovascular mortalities among whites in our six counties. And as compared to the, the dark triangles, which is the mortality on a daily basis associated with the elements for Hispanics in the six counties. So again, it's the same models as we used before, but just looking at the, the, the specific groups. And you see the, the white triangles are basically around the zero percent change, basically showing no association for a lot of the elements. In contrast, the Hispanic mortality uh, ranges from roughly, I'd say, two to six percent or so. So much larger effects um, for this subgroup um, relative to the white population. And that effect seems to hold up for many of the same elements, for PM2.5, for um, three-day lags, let's say, in, in um, OC. We see effects from nitrates, uh, sulfates, um, in some of the metals like zinc down at the far end. So um, we see some, some pretty good evidence that there is uh, effect modification, i.e. sensitive subgroups that are exposed, uh, that are affected by some of these particular elements. Yes, there's a question? <laughs> 
I see on the for, for whites, we see, you know, most everything around a 0% effect modification for whites. Mm -hmm. um, however, and we see a broader expanse of those numbers, more, um, a broad, I guess, a, a bigger effect. However, for the Hispanic numbers, we also see several of the um, numbers below the excess risk. So to me, it seems like we have a wider range in effect, although not necessarily a worse effect. Okay, well, it's a good observation that the confidence intervals are wider, and that's due to the smaller counts, probably, of mortality among Hispanics, since, because there's less mortality among that subgroup overall than there are for whites in California. So that means that you're going to get wider confidence intervals in the estimates. And yes, we do also see um, for both groups that some of the confidence intervals include zero and some are even slightly below the line. I mean, basically you're saying in that case that uh, you can't reject the hypothesis that, the, that it's different than zero. Basically, it's zero. Um, but we do see, as you've, as you've observed, that um, for the Hispanic group, there's a lot more higher estimates and a lot more statistically significant higher estimates relative to the white population. So the evidence is still pretty um, compelling that there is some effect modification for that group. And you know, there's a lot of noise in these estimates anyway. These estimates in any of these studies um, for any um, element or even for PM2.5 or PM10, you tend to see a lot of movement in these, um, in the particular regression estimates. And that's partially um, because the, we're, we are estimating a relatively small effect. I mean, you're only explaining about 2%, maybe 4% of the daily mortality. So uh, small changes in uh, factors like the spatial uh, dispersion of the pollutants relative to the population. You know, these things are all monitored at a central site. So it's how is that population arranged? I mean, you could take two cities that are uh, almost identical, but the monitor is located in a slightly different area. That can change these beta estimates. Um, and there's other factors as well, the composition and all. So it's not surprising in these studies to see a lot of variation in the estimates. As I mentioned in the MNAP studies as well, a lot of variation in the beta estimates. So this is actually showing a fairly consistent picture as these things go of a higher effect among Hispanics. As long as we're stopped here, is there other questions? Yeah. One second, wait for the uh, mic. Fairly consistent. Uh, more, greater significance for the three-day lag than for the zero. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, it's probably that you might not expect uh, the effect to occur exactly on that same day that there's a lag between the time people are exposed, you know, usually a day or two, um, and the inflammatory response or whatever the mechanism might be occurs, and before you see the, the actual endpoint occurring, the mortality occurring. Um, actually, the studies indicate that, most studies indicate that a, a lag of a, a day or two, um, sometimes up to four or five days, um, can show larger effects than the same day. Whereas for ozone, we tend to see responses more in a more immediate way. So it's probably relating to the mechanism, although we don't know enough about the mechanism of all these different components. We don't know whether we should expect different types of lags for different mechanisms. But finding effects that are stronger after a day or two is, is um, to be expected. And did this wind up being the one that showed the most significant result? The question was um, what happened with lags of one and two days and all. Um, in general, yeah, usually the zero to three gives you a bound on the total effects. There were some cases where a lag of one or two popped up, but those might be anomalies. So zero to three really give you the bounds of where the effects are for the most part. Yeah. Um, and also zero and three are actually comparing the same day of mortality. So in a way, it's a nice comparison to use. Another question here. Hi, Bart. Um, your response variable, the daily counts, are those by county? Yeah, each, each one of these analyses, um, we did a separate estimate using countywide mortality and air pollution. We got a beta coefficient for that county, and then we combined them 
using a meta-analysis. So yeah, all the counts are county-specific initially, and then these estimates are the, the meta-estimates for all the counties. I have a question. Uh, oh, oh, over here. Yeah. I, I'm kind of, I, I was kind of surprised by, by the results, um, especially considering that Hispanics have a, a slightly higher life expectancy than whites. And I'm wondering if what we're seeing is a better exposure assessment for Hispanics versus whites. What you, you, have, you have one central monitor per county, or at least one central location. You may have two, two monitors located next to each other. And so I, I'm wondering if, you know, the, that Hispanics or other groups are, are living closer to that monitor and that, that, and that, and that their exposure assessment is, 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 is better. Maybe okay, I'm going to get to that in a couple slides, so I'll, I'll address that directly, okay? Okay, one more question, then we'll move on here. Either there's a lot of interest or I'm not doing a good job explaining it. We just have some pent-up demand. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, actually, back to, uh, the, it relates to this slide and a previous slide where you mentioned uh, tobacco smoking and so on. And um, it, this makes me wonder, um, I know in cross-sectional studies, they throw in smoking and things like that to adjust uh, your results. But here, um, I'm wondering if you, if you did, rather than PM, you were using smoking or ETS, would you get similar effects? Well, you would use a different study design. In the cross-sectional studies, you need to control for smoking because you're controlling across individuals. So you're looking at one individual's profile versus another in those long-term, either the cross-sectional studies or the cohort studies like the ACS, the Cancer Society cohort. <coughs> then you need to control for all individual risk factors because you're looking at uh, individual survival. And certainly smoking and f occupational exposure will control individual survival as well as many other factors. Here though, you're looking not at the individual, you're looking at daily counts. And so you're just saying, do counts increase on a daily basis as air pollution changes on a daily basis? So smoking then is not, there's no need to include the smoking in that because, again, you're thinking that smoking rates um, for the individual and for the group don't change on a daily basis with air pollution. So there's a very important need to control for smoking and some other factors, many other factors, when you're looking at individual survival, which is what the long-term cohorts look at or the cross-sectional studies look at. But the beauty of the daily time series study is, it, is that it you don't really need to worry about those things that don't vary with air pollution. And, and smoking is not going to vary with air pollution on a daily basis. Well, I understand that. I'm just thinking that there could be an interaction where, say, on a really hot or cold day, people are spending more time indoors, so you get a double whammy from smoking plus more ETS exposure. And there's a similar issue maybe with, um, you know, ethnic groups where they may have a higher smoking rate. So this would consistent with these results. So I'm, I'm suggesting there may be these interactive effects, especially in ethnic groups, or maybe, for example, if you look at wood smoke, where you have maybe an ur a, a, a urban versus regional difference, or some of your areas have <coughs> some populations, say, in the foothills, where there's much colder climate. So there may be um, some of these effects that are interacting with your, your climate and with uh, ethnicity and so on. And so it'd be interesting to look at that. And one other question just before you go on is that did you, when you looked at weather adjustments uh, or factors, did you do some interactive uh, variables, uh, say for heat stress index uh, or even just temperature times humidity or you know, temperature over a certain level? We've seen that in, say, some of the, the children's health studies when they did uh, ozone and temperature models and so on. And there was clearly kind of a threshold there now we, of course, are very concerned about heat stress. Yeah. Well, there's a lot going on in your question. So let me just say that um, the nice thing about the smooth is it controls for the pattern in temperature. So if you expect no effect until you get to a very high level, the smooth will actually take that into account. Whereas if you just put a linear term in for temperature, as most traditional models would do, it might just smooth out too much that, that association. You might not see the fact that it's a J-shaped curve. So the beauty of the smooth is, in fact, it does control for the higher ends of, of temperature. Um, 
I haven't seen much evidence to date of significant interactions between um, temperature and um, air pollution. There's potential confounding, of course, between ozone and temperature. And um, actually, we just had a paper accepted that looks at the effects of temperature on mortality controlling for air pollution. And we actually found that the temperature effects, at least in California, look to be pretty independent of temperature. So we've, we've been able to isolate high temperature effects as well as air pollution effects that appear to be pretty independent. Okay? So that's going to be coming out. It uh, just got accepted in epidemiology. So, all right, let me um, move on um, to another group, which is um, broken down by educational attainment. And here, are the the uh, I think the results are even more compelling than Hispanic per se, although there's certainly some overlap between these two groups. But here we see again the white triangles are high school graduates, and you can see here again. A, a grouping around zero for all of the species for versus when we look at non-high school graduates, we see much higher effects, more in the four to six percent range for the IQR. And we, we tested for statistical differences between the two groups and found, in fact, that by education, there are a lot of statistical differences in the terms of the effects of the species. We found particularly things like PM2.5, EC, OC, nitrates, sulfates, and some of the metals um, to be to show quite important effects among the group uh, that has not graduated high school. So what does that mean in response to the last question? Does that mean that we should people who don't have high school diploma should rush out and get a high school diploma on the web and then They'll be protected? Probably not. Um, so the question is, what does this education mean? And we could also say, what does this Hispanic category mean? And in a way, there's three different, uh, somewhat related, but three, uh, three factors that you could say is being measured by this education. One, it could be possible exposure. We published a paper two years ago that showed that lower income people and people of color do tend to be located closer to highways um, and near busy roadways. So there might be uh, greater exposure and um, differences in classification of exposure among low education, uh, people with lower education. Education is also associated with income. There's very high correlations with income. And that means there's a whole suite of factors related to lower SES, things like higher rates of smoking and um, probably worse diet, exercise habits, higher obesity, and lower access and use uh, of medical care. So there's a whole set of factors that are related to education that uh, make people more susceptible to air pollution and to other factors as well. And finally, education, and this is related, education might be related or is related to comorbidity, that is, that lower education, lower income groups tend to have uh, more cardiovascular disease, higher rates of diabetes and many other um, cardiovascular diseases. There was one interesting study done in Rome, Italy, where, um, as you probably know, in Europe, um, higher income people tend to live in the city centers, and lower income people tend to live outside of the city. And um, so that was a, a unique study in where you could attempt to separate out exposure versus income. And they found that uh, the, the lower income people, even with the lower exposures, those living outside of the city center, where there's fewer concentration of diesel particles, um, still had very significant effects, higher effects than the higher income people. So exposure may play a role. I'm sure it does play a role, but it doesn't play the entire role. Even those groups that have lower exposure rates, like in Europe, in the suburbs, um, still had higher effects uh, on, in terms of mortality and morbidity. And the authors went on to indicate that it likely was due to comorbidity, that the underlying rates of disease among these groups uh, are much higher. So they're more susceptible um, because of their existing conditions and more likely to suffer the immediate consequences of exposure to elemental carbon and organic carbon and nitrates and so on. So 
the, that's our, briefly our preliminary results for um, uh, education and race, ethnicity, and and gender. Um, let me go on to hospital admissions and we can answer some questions at the end, okay? Or you have a pressing question, go ahead. Oh. Sure, my, my, my question was not about uh, greater exposure, which, which I'm, you know, which, 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 you know, may be true, probably is true for, for, um, for uh, Hispanics, other minorities, um, and, and, and if you use, like, um, um, level of education as a, as a, as a surrogate for sort of other SES indicators. My, my, my question relates to exposure assessment, whether, whether um, nearness to a, you know, your, your metric to, for exposure is, is a, a monitored um, number. And so uh, nearness to that monitor is going gonna, is gonna to give you a better estimate of, the, of what people are, are exposed to. And the further away you are from that monitor, um, is, is going to give you um, uh, people is going to give you an estimate that's, that's not as good. Right. It could be that that the you know the further away from that monitor, your exposure to PM could be greater, could be lesser, um, and um, and as, as as long as it's different, it's going to give you it, it's going to it's going to attenuate the 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 effect uh, um, between your exposure and whatever endpoint you choose. Right. And so and so I. My, so my, my point is that if you're closer to the monitor, your exposure assessment is going to be better. I'm, one, you know, I'm wondering how, I'm, I'm, I think, I'm thinking that that may be, you know, that the, the, the people of the minorities and low SES communities are located closer to the monitor. I'm wondering your comments on that. Okay, well stated. I, I have no problem with your hypothesis. <clears throat> We're actually looking at that now using our GIS techniques to see is as you move in buffers further away from the monitors, whether the uh, socioeconomics and race ethnicity change as you move away. And we've only looked, I've only physically looked at um, results for a couple of the monitors, and it doesn't look like uh, all Hispanics or most Hispanics are close to the monitor, and as you get away, it, it gets you know whiter or whatever. I, it's certainly true in some of the cases, but I don't think it's true in in all the cases. But we're looking at that more carefully, and what we're going to do is we're going to use our GIS techniques to um, specifically take a smaller area around the monitor, <coughs> and then go to wider and wider areas, and um, we want to exactly look at the effects of measurement misclassification, which is basically what you're talking about, to see how that affects our estimates. So we're going to look at that empirically um, over the next over the next year, I would say. So it is a it is a concern, and it, and it might be possible. Although our my preliminary look at the data doesn't indicate that that's going to be explaining it, but it might play some role. Uh, Bart, okay. uh, just before you leave the uh, say cool season uh, chart where you, it looks like you have um, you know, tighter groupings and more s higher level of significance in the uh, cardiovascular mortality compared to full year. Um, and then also the other thing I was wondering if you could comment on is that you have a real tight grouping for the uh, last category, the PM extended, the additional counties or whatever. I was just wondering what's going on, what do you think is going on with those two uh, yeah. trends? The tighter confidence interval is, again, because we have more counties, more data. So you have more data, even for the same effect, um, the confidence intervals will shriek. You'll get, a, you'll get a more precise estimate. So that's explaining that. Um, the winter phenomenon, uh, again, there could be a couple different factors. It could be uh, driven by, in, in some counties, by the wood smoke that um, peaks in the winter. So there's a different in difference in composition, a difference in exposure patterns as well in the winter. Um, we still get probably a lot of penetration in California in the winter from outdoors to indoors. And it might be due to the, just the higher signal, the fact that, as I mentioned, for most of the pollutants, the, most of the components we looked at, the concentrations are higher in the winter by two or three times. So it just might be the signal is there, and um, it's easier to find an effect given that it exists. So when the levels are lower, it just might be harder to find that effect. 
Um, one thing I'll show in my results, and I didn't discuss it at all, we also looked at coarse particles in the paper that was published last year. And um, coarse particles, of course, are higher in the summers and our dry summers here. And we didn't find a coarse effect in the winter as opposed to fine, the fine particle components. But we do find a coarse particle effect in our summer. So again, it might be the signal is a lot higher. Um, the coarse particles were like 14 times higher in the in the summer, something like that, 10 or 14 times higher. So it might be that the signal itself plays a role as well. So some um, preliminary results on hospitalization. Again, I don't expect people to memorize all the results, but <clears throat> the important thing to get out of the hospital admissions is that it really supports these findings of on mortality. And let me give you a couple examples. Um, again, these are the different subgroups that we looked at, total respiratory, uh, for all ages and ages below five. And in that case, that includes a lot of pneumonia, bronchitis, and wheeze. We looked at asthma for ages five to 18 and chronic bronchitis and, and many other categories. But uh, for total respiratory, again, the charts, the, the graph is similar to as I've described before with zero and three lag percent risk on the Y axis. And for total respiratory, all ages, again, we see effects from fine particles from EC and OC, a nitrate effect, and um, occasionally the metals and potassium um, kick in as well in terms of showing associations. We look at uh, children under five, a, a group of particular concern, and a lot of this is uh, acute bronchitis, pneumonia, and like a pre-asthma condition, probably wheeze, because asthma can't really be well diagnosed. Um, at that early an age. But again, important associations with components like EC and OC, um, with nitrates, and again, with iron and, and some of these other metals. Asthma, uh, we don't see as much probably because the uh, counts are a lot lower for asthma uh, in, this, in this age group. But we're beginning to see associations with, uh, we see it with PM2.5, and, and we're, we're showing positive associations, not statistically significant with EC and OC. Again, find effects from, from nitrates. And um, I'm guessing with another year or two or three of data, we might actually see associations with, with asthma. Uh, this one popped up, chronic bronchitis, COPD. Um, again, associations with EC and OC. And then actually sulfates um, came into play here. And again, um, some other elements as well. Looking at uh, cardiovascular results, here's the ones that really support the cardiovascular mortality. Here's all admissions for cardiovascular disease. Again, some of the components, uh, ECOC nitrates, iron playing a role as well as PM2.5, the same uh, elements that played a role with mortality are coming in here with morbidity. Um, and also we see the same effect modification that we talked about. If we look at uh, cardiovascular admissions to hospitals among the white population, uh, we see effects of around 1% and some associations with some of the particular elements. But if we go to Hispanic, you see now the effects are higher, more like 2%. Um, with some associations among some of the ele ele elements. So stronger effects among the Hispanic population um, with the cardiovascular emissions. We didn't have uh, high school and non-high school graduation for the hospital admissions. That's not on the hospital records that we have. Um, then looking at some of the categories, we see uh, heart attack admissions uh, to be associated with uh, many of the elements, particularly EC, OC, um, sulfates, all playing a role. And you know, there's been maybe three or four studies in the last year linking PM2.5 to uh, myocardial infarctions. And now we're seeing some of the specific elements within that mix that might be playing a role in terms of uh, heart attacks, which might be really driving a lot of these mortality results. We see here the morbidity endpoint as well playing a role. But we don't see much association with congestive heart failure admissions or with stroke admissions. So it's really, it looks like the ischemic heart disease admissions uh, that are associated with those elements and likewise playing a role with the mortality. So 
um, we see a fairly consistent pattern between the hospital admissions and the mortality in terms of the types of elements that play a role as well as the types of endpoints that seem to be associated with those elements. So a little bit on biological plausibility. Do these things make sense given the current knowledge? Um, we found that uh, among the components of PM2.5, um, the biological mechanisms for effects have been uh, investigated most, ex most extensively for diesel exhaust, um, including both EC and, and organic carbon. And in California, there's not a lot of data on that on this, but it looks from what I've, I was able to find about 65 to 80 percent of the EC in California uh, can be traced to diesel. Since we don't have a lot of other uh, combustion sources, we don't have again we don't have the coal and the uh, oil fuel oil. Wood smoke is the other large source of EC. So if we see an EC effect, it's likely due to either diesels or to um, wood smoke or biomass combustion. And um, there's evidence of effects of um, these uh, of, uh, from EC and OC from epidemiologic studies, from animal toxicology studies, as well as human clinical studies. And all these, all these studies suggest some mechanism for toxicity. I won't go into the details on all this, just to indicate that there are these studies that look at uh, cardiovascular markers and, for example, EC and OC have been associated with oxidative stress, uh, ECG changes, ST depression, and uh, heart rate variability. And um, all of these things are considered to be predictive of subsequent heart disease, uh, lung disease, um, even uh, sleep problems, sleep disorders, and, and several other outcomes. But they're fairly clear predictors of subsequent cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Also, we know that, as I've indicated, um, the, there's many studies now on either PM2.5 or on traffic, where they use proximity to traffic as a, as a proxy for exposure. And these, um, and these uh, exposures have been associated with heart attacks in several studies in the U.S. and in, Canada, in uh, Europe. And also regarding metals, our findings with metals, uh, metals come from fuel combustion, from brake wear, from lubricating oil from tire dust, other sources as well. These are among the primary uh, sources. And um, there's results that these things do contribute to a reactive oxygen species and are also um, associated with markers of inflammation. So there's uh, indications that the metals will also provoke responses that are ultimately related to um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, also, there's, there's some evidence from other studies on um, respiratory outcomes, similar to some of the in income outcomes that we've seen, um, that uh, diesel particles um, induce pulmonary inflammation, and uh, human and animal studies indicate that diesel particles um, may induce inflammation and symptoms among asthmatics and atopics. So again, there's studies out there in the literature um, carefully controlled clinical studies and toxicologic studies um, showing in that the intermediate steps, uh, that there's association with these intermediate markers of cardiovascular disease. So a summary of um, all these findings, again, there's a lot of findings going on, but <clears throat> we do see some overriding patterns among all of this. We find that mortality and morbidity are associated with uh, particles from uh, gasoline and diesel engines, if we think that ECOC nitrates and metals are pretty good markers for these things from wood smoke and from other combustion sources. Um, our notable associations are that uh, mortality and morbidity from cardiovascular disease are associated with many of these specific elements, especially um, uh, myocardial infarction, especially heart attacks in both mortality and morbidity we find associations, and among Hispanics. And when we had the data among lower educated people, um, there seems to be associations again with several of these specific components and mortality and morbidity. And also we find um, respiratory admissions uh, for children related to some of these same species. As I indicated, the wintertime effects seem to be stronger. 
except for the case of coarse particles. We found that, um, in general, the excess mortality risks are between 1 or 2 percent, but they seem to be two or three times greater for these so-called uh, susceptible populations that we've looked at. There seems to be an effect modification by race, ethnicity, and SES. And I wanted to just point out that what we broadly defined, or what the, the um, death certificates broadly define as Hispanics, uh, among that group, 50% um, are non-high school graduates, and 17% are living below the poverty level, versus 12% and 4% for whites. So the rates are about four times higher in terms of non-high school graduates and poverty among Hispanic population in California. Um, in our study, about 80% of, quote, Hispanics were actually from of uh, Mexican origin. Another 10% are Central and South American origin. Um, preliminary results indicate that some of, the species, some of the species have particularly high unit risks, like EC and metals, which could be very important. And um, my summary point seven and eight are really on the caveat side, so let me make these pretty clear. First, as I indicated, the sample size is small, so stronger associations are possible as we get more data, uh, as our power to detect is improved. But it's also possible that because of the smallness of the data, we have some spurious results. So only when we have more data and replicate things will we really know the answer to that. When we looked at PM2.5, though, as, as was noticed, uh, when we had more data on PM2.5, the confidence intervals tended to tighten up, and we still saw a lot of those associations. So um, it's reasonable to conclude that the same results will hold for some of the species as well. And also, as we discussed a little bit, um, results may be impacted by the measurement issues. Uh, most importantly, a given species might be a marker for other correlated pollutants, whether we measured them or not. So there's going to be some correlation between some of these components because they come from similar sources. So we've got to be careful about identifying any single source. Second, there's going to be differential uh, instrument error for the different species. And that could play a role in terms of the beta estimates. If some of these species are measured particularly poorly or there's a lot of uh, variation in the estimates, uh, lab error, detection error, um, that could affect the beta estimate that we were talking about. And finally, um, as we talked about, there could be differential spatial pattern of the species. So the monitors could be doing better at picking up certain species than others. So we attempt to, we're going to attempt to address some of these issues that I'm caveating in subsequent studies. And let me indicate what we're going to do. We'd like to repeat some of these studies with a larger data set. We'll bring along more counties and um, more years. So more, more and more counties are coming online with the speciation network. So we can add them to our study and also add more years of mortality and morbidity data. We're also in the, involved um, with UC Berkeley and um, in, in developing a chemical mass balance model. So rather than looking at the specific components, um, we'll use these models to estimate the effects of sources on a daily basis rather than components. And I, I think there's reasons to look at sources as a whole, because we do regulating of sources, and there's also reasons to look at uh, specific elements so we know the constituents that are of concern. As I indicated now, we're estimating the independent effects of temperature uh, uh, and, morbi on mor and mortality, uh, sorry, temperature and air pollution separately on mortality. And we're going to do that for morbidity as well to make sure that we can identify separate effects for temperature and, and uh, air pollution and the species. And we're going to look specifically uh, at potential synergisms between those effects, interactions between those effects of temperature and pollution. We're going to do some more work on susceptible subgroups. And also, as I indicated, we're going to do a, I think, a, I, we're doing a project on GIS where um, we're going to take um, smaller buffers around each of the monitors. So, uh, for example, we might take a 2K or 5K monitor. Then we'll be able to more fairly look at the different um, species. 
So species that have wide distribution and those that are spatially less uh, um, homogeneous, when we look at a smaller group, uh, a smaller buffer around the monitor, we'll control for, the fa for that aspect of the spatial differences. So um, using um, address codes that we have uh, for, the, for the mortality cases, we're going to be looking at that more carefully to see what role measurement error and mis misclassification might play in our conclusions here and our results to date. So that's what we have to date, and I uh, thank you all for uh, listening in. And I think um, I'll take some more questions or some uh, emailed questions if there are. And I would like to remind our web viewers that the address for sending questions is CRRM, S I E R R A R M, at calepa dot c a dot g o v. And we do have one question from uh, Professor Mike Lehman. And Bart, do you want to read the question? Okay. The first question says, a fine presentation, very interesting. Maybe we should just stop there. <laughs> no. um, surprising that LA and Orange were not at the center of your statistical analysis. Um, since they have such large populations, will they be included in, in the future? Um, well, as I indicated, um, like I guess I, di I didn't indicate, we added LA to the PM 2.5 data. Um, but LA did not meet our criteria as of 2003 of having enough observations, nor did uh, Orange County. But as we move forward into additional years of data, uh, we definitely will include uh, as many counties as we could, not just LA and Orange, but we'd like to really get a wide spectrum of other counties as well, both for our, our uh, air pollution analysis, our species analysis, as well as our temperature analysis. So. The answer is yes, we're going to add them. Um, we already have some data for um, 2003, 2004, and 5, I think, for LA, which will meet our criteria. And then probably our next analysis um, will include LA. And I'm not sure about Orange, but again, any counties that have enough data will, will be included. So we have a, data, a question here on the, on the floor. Yeah, uh, a number of the uh, sources, uh, combustion sources and, uh, you know, traffic-related sources, that kind of thing, are uh, strong emitters of uh, ultrafine particles. Uh, have you looked at uh, uh, that as a, uh, one of the sources of uh, some of the impacts that you're seeing? Well, as you <coughs> probably know, ultrafines ultimately will agglomerate and become fine particles of different sizes um, or fine particles of different constituents. So in a way that's indirectly uh, included in the analysis. In terms of fresh emissions of ultrafines, which are of course of concern, we, we didn't. And it's actually very difficult to do that um, because the, the spatial distribution of ultrafines is very, very localized, right? So um, in order to do these time series analyses, whether it be hospital emissions or mortality, you need to have a large enough population that's being measured by the monitors. So for the most part, these types of analyses are, are precluded um, regarding ultrafines. You really need a different type of study design, like a panel study where you have a group of people located near a, a monitor, and you know that, I say close, to, really close to that monitor, and you know what's ever being measured at, at that monitor is reasonably representative of what those people are exposed to. So we can't um, directly measure the effects of ultrafines, um, except to note that the monitors that we use are specifically not located, or I should, let me rephrase that, are specifically located away from sources like, like uh, highways and major roadways by design. And so we're thinking that these effects are not really the effects of ultrafine, fresh ultrafine emissions. Um, there might be, I've seen a couple of studies now in Europe where they show effects of both PM2.5 and of ultrafines because their monitors tend to be located closer to roadways and all. But uh, we don't think it's a confounding factor in this case. A uh, quick question. Uh, you had one table where you had different elements and the percent risk and so on. I don't remember which. In fact, it was. I don't think it was in your handout. But um, 
most of them were like 0.5 to 2 percent, but potassium stood out at 6, um, as I recall, at the bottom there. Right. Or the beta. Um, that uh, certainly suggests wood smoke is a big problem. Uh, how confident are you in those results, and what are the implications? Uh, well, we we know that there are effects of wood smoke. There's been a couple of good studies, both clinical, human clinical studies with people in chambers, um, as well as epidemiologic studies of wood smoke. So we know there's effects of wood smoke. Um, the I would add the same, and, and the evidence here certainly seems to suggest that there's a, an effect from the epidemiologic side, both based on this table as well as the wintertime effects, which seem to be larger. Um, having said that, I would again repeat the caveat that when you see this number here, that doesn't mean it's only K, it's only potassium itself, since these, there's intercorrelations between the components it could be K plus EC plus OC and other things, but I, I think there's some reasonable evidence here that um, wood smoke is, is definitely of concern. Again, I wouldn't take these numbers too, too literally. Another email. Okay, the question here is, if wintertime effects were higher but diesel PM produced, producing activities are much lower, what are the other sources of OC, EC, et cetera? Well, I think I've, I've sort of answered that. When, if wintertime's effects are higher, um, it says, what are the other sources of ECOC? I mean, basically, it's diesel and wood smoke produce a lot of it. I mean, any other combustion sources are going to put out EC and OC. So if we have industrial boilers, um, people here want to add any other source? What's that? Field burning would add some ECOC, yeah. Um, I think those are the primary sources in the state for ECOC. So the thing that varies the most, of course, is the wood smoke. The diesels are going to be fairly constant through the year. Uh, Bart, I know you didn't cover the economic model today, but I'm, I'm curious how you um, – it seems like it would make a big difference in economic costs of these effects if the um, – if the assumption is that these uh, hospital admins, uh, admissions or mortalities wouldn't have occurred at all versus they would have occurred two or three days later had not there been this, uh, uh, you know, the, the particular particle was higher on a certain day. Is there any way to address that question? Yeah. Um, well, we certainly have, have done quantification already that incorporates the lag. And specifically, um, what we do is we usually usually have daily data. I mean, again, this PM2.5 network is a fairly new one, and the species network is even newer. But there's many cities throughout the, state, throughout the country that have daily PM10 data. And with PM10 data there, for, we've been able to look at single-day lags of zero to five days, as well as cumulative averages. So we can look at the effects of zero, two, three, four together, zero, one, two, three to four together. And those studies have found a, that, the, as I indicated, for the most part with particles, a lag gives you a, a larger effect. But more importantly, that it's a cumulative process. So pollution today are, is going to affect not just mortality tomorrow, but it can affect mortality for a couple days. Another way of saying that is mortality today is affected by pollution for many different days. And the studies seem to show uh, that when you look at these cumulative averages of several days, the effects are two or three times higher. So we've just recommended to US EPA when they do their uh, risk assessments and their regulatory impact analyses that they consider um, carefully not just single day lags in their models, which is what they've traditionally done, but look at the effects of these cumulative exposures. So the effects um, from particles in terms of the estimated health effects as well as the benefits of reducing will be maybe uh, at least from mortality, uh, daily mortality and morbidity uh, could be two or three times larger. Now, the other part of it is what about the components and will that change things? And the answer to that could be yes as well. So if 
among the PM2.5, you could have, I mean, this is beginning to suggest that you have some sources that are extremely uh, uh, extremely toxic, like EC, OC, and some others that I didn't say much about that are don't look as, as, uh, as bad. So I could imagine that if you're doing an analysis just of EC, and I know ARB is on a very... Uh, uh, aggressive program now, as is the federal government, to reduce um, diesel emissions. Um, if we had a quantitative assessment specifically focused on EC, and we believe these numbers that I'm presenting, that means the benefits of reducing each microgram of EC are much greater than if we're using this PM2.5 proxy, which is what we do. So it has pretty big implications in terms of the potential benefits of um, controlling some of these particular constituents. So I, I think we'll need more work like this before we're ready to fine tune our benefit assessments, but this is in that path. Yeah, it said that uh, you co collected from the monitors every third day or sixth day. Were you collecting a, like a three-day integration or three-day average? No, it's just a 24-hour average, but every third day or every sixth day because they actually uh, pick up the filters and weigh them and do the chemical analysis. So. I guess because of expenses, um, it's not done every day. Okay. So it's a 24-hour mass reading every third day, and then a 24-hour mass sometimes every sixth day. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, I think that ends it. <laughs>